we cool. start. And I think it is the time for us. And everyone is actually joining us as well. All right, let me begin if it's possible. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good uh, evening in, for people in Turkey. Good morning for people in the US. And uh, good afternoon for some people, uh, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to History of Science Nights, uh, organized by the uh, Department of the History of Science in Istanbul Medinet University. Uh, my name is Taha Yasin Aslan, and my co-host is Anna Aydin. We will be uh, hosting this event, uh, hopefully. And our uh, guest tonight, the very first of our meetings, uh, the guest is Professor Cemil Recep. And uh, Sena will be able to uh, uh, start with a short biography in a moment. Uh, before that, I, let me ask, uh, let me tell you a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is usually takes uh, 45, 45 minutes of talk and 15 minutes of uh, questionnaire. So if you have any kind of questions, please do write it on the chat board and we will be actually going through them and asking for you to Professor Jamil Rajab. And uh, you don't have to wait for the last 15 minutes. You can ask, start, ask, start writing your questions at the moment. And then we will be piling up everything and ask him uh, directly uh, in accordance. So uh, you might have some sort of uh, problems with the voice and sound issues. The, we actually check the sound before the meeting starts. So if you are having a trouble, it is possible that it might be because of your connection. So before uh, asking us if there is any kind of problem, please do. Uh, get out, uh, exit the room and come back. Sometimes Zoom does that and you actually uh, solve your problem with this. And sometimes because you're actually using your mobile phones and that the connection is different than the regular, regular computers. So that might be one of the reasons as well. So you might actually try to use a computer uh, for this connection as well. So if anything doesn't work and you're still having some issues with the sounds, please do write on the chat board as well. We'll try to sort this out as well. So. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Professor. And let me uh, give the uh, microphone to Sena uh, and for her explanation. So go ahead. Dear guests, uh, our, first, um, our first speaker, Jamal Recep, uh, is born in West Virginia. He attended the University of Michigan, where he received degrees in anthropology and Near Eastern studies, uh, and later took a PhD in the history of science at Harvard University. He was Kanda Research Chair uh, in the History of Science in Islamic Societies uh, at McGill University in Montreal, Canada from 2007 until 2020, at which time he retired. He has written extensively on the history of science in Islam and has co-edited uh, books on the transmission of science between cultures and water resources in the Middle East. Thanks to major grants from the Canada Foundation for Innovation and the Quebec government, and in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, Recep was able to initiate an ongoing international effort to catalog all Islamic manuscripts in the exact sciences and provide a means to access information online on the intellectual, institutional, and scientific context of these texts. Most recently, he has published a number of articles and co-edited a volume of essays dealing with the Islamic background to the Copernican Revolution. Uh, dear Professor, it's a total honor for us uh, to have an interview with us. We are so excited about this. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'd like to start the conversation with a general inquiry about the history of Islamic science. In one of your articles, you mentioned reading Steven Weinberg's review on Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion in which uh, Winberg states that there is no science worthy of mention in the Islamic countries after Ghazali. And you say that you were astonished and uh, sent a letter to the editor um, uh, with a list of some achievements uh, by post-Ghazali Islamic scholars. Uh, Professor Weinberg combined his uh, previous statements with long discredited claims about the lack of influence and significance of late medieval Islamic science and did not restrict his claim. In your article, you mentioned that Weinberg, who claimed that Copernicus did not derive anything from astronomy in the Islamic world, and he rejected the already known studies of E.S. E. Kennedy, Otto Neubauer, Noel Swardlow, and others. So we want to ask this. 
How has post-Ghazali literature escaped the keen eye of the Orientalists and historians of science for nearly 200 years? And despite a significant research activity over the past 50 years that disproves the notion that there is no science after Ghazali, why there is a clear ignorance? What might be behind the efforts in the USA or the world in general to minimize the history of Islamic science? Well, thank you very much, Sana. Let me, let me begin by thanking you and uh, Taha for inviting me. Uh, I feel very uh, excited about being here with you and uh, initiating, uh, uh, if I can call it your international outreach, which is wonderful to see. Um, I know you've been doing this in, uh, for a Turkish audience and now you're uh, aiming for a larger one. And that's always, uh, you know, such a, a wonderful thing uh, to see, uh, especially from uh, young scholars in, uh, in Turkey and elsewhere. Um, as for your uh, question uh, about the article that uh, uh, I went back and forth on with uh, uh, Stephen Weinberg, the, the I think we, we first have to sort of back up a little bit and look at this in a very uh, long-term way. One of the things to keep in mind, you know, when we talk about how Islamic science is perceived is it's part of a larger issue, a very, um, it's a very, uh, big pro problem, we can call it, or a very uh, interesting problem between European Christendom and the Islamic world. So we can't just take this one uh, event or one thing out of context. We have to sort of see it within a larger context of how uh, European Christendom has seen the Islamic world. Now, obviously, this has gone through many stages. Uh, at, one point uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, because Islamic science was so far ahead of what was happening in Europe, Europeans were envious and obviously felt the need to catch up, we might say. So from the translation movement of the 12th century, which went from Latin, or excuse me, from Arabic into Latin, uh, you know, we, we see many centuries in which uh, there was eager engagement with Islamic science and philosophical texts. Then uh, there was a kind of reaction against this in the European Renaissance of the 15th, 16th century. It's when uh, Euro European scholars started asserting themselves uh, more vigorously, and they would say, "Yes, we, you know, we learn something from Arab scholars or Islamic scholars, but we really, uh, you know, uh, uh, have learned most of what we have gotten from the Greeks, and we are now going to surpass what happens in Islam." But Nevertheless, there was still, you know, a period of time between the 15th and 17th centuries when we see uh, European scholars very interested in what's going on in the Islamic world. For example, there was intense interest in the Samarkand Observatory and things that happened there. Uh, and there are a number of European scholars in the 16th, 17th century who learned Arabic, uh, tried to translate works that had been lost, such as uh, uh, Apollonius's Conics into uh, Latin from the Arabic translation, um, and also uh, just trying to learn more about what was going on in the Islamic world. Now, after this period, it, up to this point, we can say there's a kind of parity, if you will, between Islam and European Christendom in which, you know, 
you could say that they viewed each other as rivals, but as in a sense, equal rivals. Now this began to change during the uh, European enlightenment of the 18th and 19th century. And then that, at that point, something begins to happen. Uh, and that is that uh, Europeans saw themselves as being exceptional and distinct. And then uh, by the 19th century, we see uh, a effort to connect themselves, not with the European Middle Ages or Islam or anything like that, but only with the Greeks. So this is when we get the period where there's the Greek miracle of science and philosophy, and then there's the Dark Ages, and then the European Enlightenment. And that's the narrative that, in a sense, comes into the 20th century. Now, um, you know, when uh, someone like Steven Weinberg talks about, you know, Islam decline and all this, well, that's the, that's the background. The background is that somehow the Middle Ages, the Islamic period and so forth was completely irrelevant to anything that happened in, uh, uh, in uh, science uh, and progress of science. So uh, how, how do we, you know, how do we deal with this? Well, you might think, okay, that's all ancient history. You know, that's 18th, 19th century. We live in a more enlightened period. Uh, we had scholars like, well, the great Turkish scholar, Aydin uh, Saylu, who is on your $5 uh, lira, I think, right? And, uh, you know, he, he was a great scholar and he opened up all this amazing information about science after Bazeli, uh, the rise of the observatory, the creation of big science. In a sense, big science was created during the 13th century with the uh, Maratha Observatory. So all this, you know, this has been around for a long time. And then there was the work of Edward Kennedy and others who brought forth a lot of interesting material from this later period. Um, so why, why didn't that change the narrative? Well, <laughs> this uh, gets us into, uh, you know, the question of scholars and how scholars react to things. And one thing I think we have to realize is that scholars are like everyone else. They, they can be, you know, they're lazy, they don't <laughs> like to change, right? Uh, and I, also the narrative was so nice. I mean, you think about it, you know, Islam uh, inherited Greek science and then passed it on to Europe and then we don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. It's great, it's a great narrative. Um, it's just not true, but it's a great narrative and it's very hard to change great narratives. You know, this kind of big picture narrative like because that. Because they have to share it, I think. Because, you know, the glory needs to be shared with Muslims at some point because the oh, moment exactly. you accept it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, and, and the other part of this, uh, and I think this really does come from the, what we might call the secularization of science in the 19th, 20th centuries, where any idea that science owed anything to, an, you know, a religiously based civilization like Islam is counterintuitive. So the idea that, you know, science and religion could coexist in some way yeah. and actually feed on one another and engage with one another. It, it, it somehow was, was counter to the narrative that was being developed, especially in places like France during the Third Republic, uh, when you start getting, uh, you know, the whole idea of laicite and what have you, you know, the secularization. So anyway, um, 
this then is part of it. And, um, you know, there's also a more insidious part that I brought up in my response to uh, Weinberg. And that is that, um, you know, if, the hi if history teaches us that Islam was against science and against rationality, uh, Islam the religion that is, mm -hmm. and then therefore, uh, you know, uh, we may need to externally come in and help them out, so to speak, yeah. and change uh, their political structures. And that was one of the, I think that, uh, especially after 9-11, after the attacks uh, on the United States in 2001, uh, this was a very important notion that you know, kept coming back that, you know, uh, they can't, rep in Marx's, to paraphrase Marx, they can't represent themselves. They need to be represented yeah. and they need to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, they have to be uh, reformed from outside. And I think this is uh, a very big part, I believe, in what led us to the disaster of the Iraq war. But that's another story. Is it, is it not a little bit of different? Uh, you know, the main problem with uh, this idea uh, that they they never accept it, and they keep using the golden age as the 19th to, 9th to 12th centuries. I keep trying to correct them. You know, uh, it's not the 9th to 12th centuries because that's not even the beginning of the science in the Islamic world. And we have the golden age even after that with the Maraza, with the Mamluks, with the uh, Samarkandids. <laughs> The, the real golden age, if you want to say, uh, if there is, a, there is such a thing as golden age in the Islamic world uh, regarding science, it should be from 13th to 15th centuries at least. So, because that's the main original ideas coming up and that's the best of the observatories, best of the books written and uh, all the commentaries are now high, more, more high, higher quality than ever before. Yes, we have Biruni before, yes, we have Ibn al-Haytham, but we need to work on them, and we did work on them in the 15th, 14th centuries. So uh, this is not something uh, hidden, not in, in, in the sense, because for a, for a person who doesn't understand as a politician or a public, uh, you, understand, you expect that they wouldn't read them. But at the same time, we have conferences, we have books published in English, in German, explaining this like Edward Kennedy is not even a Muslim so uh, when you and he is actually writing a lot of things it's not just one thing he's collaborating with so many people like just like you and uh, it just doesn't actually stir, stir the pot I, I that's that's the thing I think we, we, are, we are hard to understand this so, you mean, uh, you mean why, why it hasn't changed why the uh, in, because even now, because now they actually have a new idea about using the, the word Islamicate to differentiate the scientific idea in the Islamic world. Because if you say Islamic world, that doesn't actually include, uh, you know, Christians in the, or Jews in the Islamic world. Not necessarily. We never had that problem before. But now we have to uh, have a different concept to say, uh, I think it's still not accepted uh, as much as it should. So. Yeah. Why it's so, still bothering me? I think this is one of the reasons we wanted to ask this question to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? Why? Now, and um, I, you know, the bar is very high, as as they say in English. You know, the um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't, I don't want to talk too much about Copernicus because that will really take us off the track. But uh, when you know, when I give talks about the Islamic background to Copernicus, you know, one of the things I always show is uh, the uh, Mercury model yeah. that Copernicus has in De Revolutionibus and the Mercury model of Ibn Ashatar from the uh, 14th century, the famous Damascus uh, astronomer. And um, they're identical. Absolutely identical, and it's very easy you, if you want to switch the Earth and Sun. Otherwise, it's a very, very complicated model. And I, I'll I'll put this up, and inevitably I'll get a question like, "Okay, yes, but uh, when are you, when are you going to have real proof?" And I <laughs> kept saying, 
but if this isn't proof, I don't know what is. I mean, you know, you have the, you have an absolutely identical, very complicated model that's identical. And people say, well, when are you going to get proof? And I, I guess I, I think by proof they mean they want Copernicus's affidavit, a signed statement saying, I, um, <laughs> I stole this from Ibn Ishaq, <laughs> signed Nicholas Copernicus. I mean, a notarized document yeah, and everything. And, yes. and notarized, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly, so, yeah. you know, uh, you know what, what can you say? I mean, you, you just have to uh, keep, keep at it and things, things do change. I mean, you know, um, I, I, I can give you one example where I think an entrenched idea changed over a long time. That was Duhem's, uh, Pierre Duhem's idea. Yeah that, uh, you know, um, the uh, uh, most, you know, that the important work uh, in astronomy was all instrumentalist and had nothing to do, you know, he was an anti-realist and so yeah. forth. And that, uh, you know, people like Ptolemy didn't uh, believe in the orbs and solid bodies and all the rest. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a series of articles starting in the 1970s that disputed this. And now, you know, 50 years later, most historians will say Duhem was wrong. That's good. <laughs> so things did change, but, there, but not 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, you know, you still have some historians who will defend Duhem's idea. But it does change, but it takes a long time. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, maybe I won't see it, but uh, I hope you'll be able to see the change. Well, hopefully you will see it too, yeah, because we are trying to work hard as the young uh, emerging scholars. I see Hassan Mut over there and uh, we're trying to change the idea as soon as possible for us to be able to do this much easier, uh, hopefully, yes. All right, uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Dear Professor, I, uh, we follow you as one of the historians of science who has been questioning the decline paradigm since the 1980s, and your career is filled with uh, studies that prove your claim. Uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, please, but you believe that scientific historical material should be subject to rigorous analysis by preparing critical editions and examining them under consideration uh, with a theoretical perspective. In that sense, we wonder how your experience with the history of science uh, studies began. For instance, how and why did you choose to see Teskira for your doctoral uh, dissertation subject? What difficulties did you encounter in this process? Oh, well, it, it, it's an interesting story. Uh, I'll, I'll abbreviate it. Uh, one of the first things I uh, studied as a graduate student when I first uh, was a graduate student started uh, studying with Abdul Hamid Sabra uh, at Harvard. Um, we read the Tadkera. We started reading Tadkera because it had become a little bit better known because of the writings of uh, E.S. Kennedy. Yeah. And so Sabra said, well, why don't we read the Tadkera? Uh, of course, it was, you know, it was in manuscript, but you know, we read it. And I have to say, it was one of the worst experiences of, <laughs> of my life. Uh, I didn't understand anything that was happening. <laughs> I thought it was boring. Um, I wasn't interested in astronomy that much. I was more interested in mathematics at the time. And so that the you know, semester came to an end I pushed all that to one side and I didn't think about it for, I don't know, uh, five or, you know, at least five or six years. Five or six years, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, pardon me? I'm that sorry. long, five or six yeah. years. It, yeah, yeah, no, until, well, let me, let me think. Uh, no, maybe it was three or four years, okay. What convinced you then? <laughs> yeah, I did, I, uh, so what happened was, then uh, 
uh, I spent two years doing research in Syria and Egypt. Hmm. And um, I was, you know, I, I, I just look at manuscripts. It was just my, a wonderful opportunity. It was my first time in manuscript libraries. I was at the Zahariya Library in Damascus and the Darul Qutb in uh, Cairo. And I started, you know, browsing manuscripts. And then I found, you know, all of these commentaries on Tusi's Tadkara. And, you know, they're huge. And you know, I started reading them. My Arabic was a little bit better by then, so I could read read uh, a little more quickly. And I thought, my goodness, these people are really. And the, it goes on for centuries, right? Tusi writes in the 13th century. They're still going, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, I thought, well, you know, they they're taking this seriously. Maybe I should think about it. Uh, give him a second chance. And uh, so uh, I think it was that I, I became less interested in mathematics, um, you know, doing a mathematical uh, uh, dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, okay, well, these, uh, you know, uh, they, they're talking about these orbs and their philosophical ideas and so forth. And so I became a lot more interested in it. And so I changed my dissertation topic. Uh, uh, I, I was just looking at this the other day, I was going through some old papers and I actually had to write uh, a whole thing explaining why I was switching and explaining why, you know, well, I, I discovered all these uh, manuscripts that say Tusi's Tadkara is interesting. So maybe I should write <laughs> that it is interesting. Um, and that's uh, that's really how I got involved with it. Uh, you know, it was uh, I think it was my my trying to answer the question why was this so influential, and also why did this tradition of, of commentaries and so forth why did it last so long, and why is it interconnected? with so many other things. Uh, in other words, if you read a work on Kalam, for example, on theology, they're quoting him, or even Quran tafsirs, uh, no, yeah. exe exegesis and so forth. It, it's, it was a very influential work on many levels. Uh, and so since I was somewhat interested in you know, the sociology of science too, I thought, well, you know, this is something that would be important to do. Um, and I, 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 I th and you know, I don't, you know, the other part of the question uh, that someone was asking is about, uh, you know, critical editions and so forth. And Sabra insisted that we had to um, uh, edit, uh, you know, all our, uh, at least one text before he would give us a PhD. Oh. And so, yeah, so we, uh, all of his students ended up uh, editing. And uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was a very important, uh, you know, part of our training. Uh, because it we had been hard read. though, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. he made us read slowly. It, mm. it was interesting. He, 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 we might go a whole semester and read four or five pages sometimes, oh. <laughs> but we would read very slowly. And every time we would read something, he would say, I don't understand this. And then we'd have to spend a week or two doing research on that sentence or whatever, and then come back and discuss it and so forth. So the idea of reading slowly and carefully was a very important part of, of it. And uh, I think that was good training for later on having to deal with this mass of material. Um, although, you know, by then I had to read more quickly, but, uh, you know, but at least finding things and then trying to understand why are they talking about this? Why, for example, you know, uh, why is Tusi talking about the Earth's motion, for example, and saying, 
you can't prove the earth is at rest. Mm. I thought, well, you know, and then, and then, you know, and I say, well, that's an interesting, I don't know. Why is he talking about this? Yeah. But then I would open a commentary and there would be like maybe 10 pages explaining why this was an important, you know, what the issue was. And they were bringing in all kinds of ideas, uh, some, you know, mathematical, some physical, some religious, some metaphysical ideas that they were bringing in. So it was, uh, you know, I was discovering at that time a way to take a text and then use commentaries to understand the text and also to uh, somehow engage with the larger issues by seeing what, what the people themselves thought was important. Why are these, why is someone like a uh, Nisaburi or a Giorgiani or whatever writing, what, why, what do they think uh, is important and why do they think it's important? So this, this was just my way of, in a way, uh, why it became important to me, why Tuzi's Tathkira became important was because it opened up this whole way of looking at this tr long tradition of, uh, uh, of engagement with a text. By the way, I should say to our audiences, uh, although you say this opened up for you, well, it wasn't just opening up for you because this is one of the few texts uh, that, uh, that were studied at the time. So you were opening a new era for all of the history of science studies, I think, because uh, even in the beginning, uh, we start seeing uh, uh, you know, very uh, you know, closed ideas about the manuscripts, about the specific manuscripts, like uh, you know, Marakushi's uh, Jamil Mabadi, Sedio works on it, but works uh, in a specific manner that never understanding all of those uh, commentaries and uh, with the philosophical backgrounds or religious backgrounds, anything. It's just focusing on specific things or instrument makers only dealing with instruments. Uh, you, uh, your studies, I think, was opening up to, uh, we're opening up to all of us with, with many new questions that we now ask all the time at the moment, I think. So I, I know you never say this, of course, but uh, you know, this is because uh, as a pioneer that you wouldn't probably say that, but this is quite important for us even today. So we are still doing the same thing, so. Uh, that, that, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, well, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure Sabra was, I mean, he liked the idea that it was a text, but when I started getting off on all these commentaries, especially the late ones, um, he and I won't name all the senior people who told me I was crazy to do this. <laughs> um, it, you know, uh, it, it was, it, 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 they, they thought this was uh, a terrible idea of, engaging with these uh, all these later people because the assumption was that a commentary is just uh by a second-rate scholar and you'd never find anything interesting in a commentary hmm. so you know the fact that i was reading these things uh i i i, I could tell my uh colleagues uh, and there were several in Cairo, they tried to discourage me. Um, they, they tried to get me to, uh, you know, focus more. Uh, but, you know, I found it fascinating. I just found it fascinating. So I just kept at it. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know quite the word, it, it, it was disdain. Uh, kind of hostility toward the later period and these later scholars. I mean, what? Why would anyone read a Giorgiani? Why would anyone read, uh, you know, an Ali Kushji, for example? If they and, knew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when I discovered Ali Kushji, um, I mean, he was like an unknown. 
I mean, uh, there right. there had been a work by him, by uh, Adivar, and but you know, dismissing him really, and mm -hmm. uh, but the you know suddenly you know I was reading uh, what he was writing, and I was saying, oh my God, this is uh, this is amazing stuff, and uh, so I was it was very exciting. It was very exciting for me uh, to uh, to discover it. Uh, but you know, it did, it had its downside because yeah. you know, <laughs> when, when, like when every people are, telling, are saying you're crazy to do this, <laughs> number one and number two, it was taking a long time. Uh, that's, right. that's the downside. Yeah, thank you. And very much. Uh, you have witnessed uh, uh, firsthand the development of historiography of the history of science uh, as a student of Sabra. So. We wish to dig a little bit uh, into this. In a letter to a friend in Alexandria, uh, Sabra explains that Karl Popper was uh, the reason for his interest in history of science. Uh, consequently, he completed uh, his doctoral studies with a thesis titled Explanation, Hypothesis, and Experiments, a study of methods of research in physics illustrated by the development of optics in the 17th century. Uh, at the University of London under Karl Popper's supervision. Uh, could you tell us the relationship between Karl Popper and Sabra? Uh, Sabra, as a student of Popper, was quite interested in philosophy and the history of philosophy, to which uh, he made a number of contributions. Sabra, though, also became a first-rate historian and uh, who devolved into historical problems and context in a way Popper uh, likely never intended. Could you expand on this and in particular how Sabra's work might be considered a contribution to historical epistemology? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, uh, I, I didn't know very much about Popper when I became a Sabra student, but it, it didn't take very long to hear a lot about Popper. Uh, Sabra talked about him a lot. Um, I should tell you, um, you know, you probably know that uh, uh, Popper had a lot of students, a lot of famous students. Um, uh, and uh, just before he died, uh, he wrote me a little note. Popper wrote me a, a, a note. And he said, you know, uh, Bashu Sabra had been his best student. Wow. It was very surprising because, you know, if you look at the list of all the people who uh, studied with Popper, I won't go through the list, you know, they're well known. Uh, it was a little surprising. It wasn't surprising because Sabra was an amazing man and a brilliant man. Uh, it was more surprising to me because I got the feeling that Popper was not uh, always pleased with the way uh, Sabra had become so immersed in historical work. And this, I need to explain this a little bit. Uh, of course, Popper uh, was interested in history and uh, part of his ideas about uh, doing philosophy of science was using historical examples. But his idea of using historical examples tended to be, um, I won't say superficial, but I don't think Popper was exactly someone you can think of as going in and doing critical editions and spending <laughs> a lot of time in manuscript libraries. Um, so when Sabra decided to do this, um, and I think he did it because he was really interested, he became interested in Ibn al-Haytham after his work on 17th century optics. Sabra had written originally on 17th century optics, did a very nice uh, book on that, um, and had you know tried to integrate uh, philosophy of science with history of science. But then when he, when Sabra went back to Egypt and discovered the work of Mustafa Nazif, uh, who had written this work on uh, Ibn al-Haytham's optics, uh, I think Sabra 
you know, felt that he wanted to edit Ibn Haytham's optics and wanted to really understand him within a historical context. And this, this then gets me to part of the uh, explanation of, I think, Sabra's uh, philosophy of history, his own historiography. And I think it becomes closest to what people today call uh, historical empiricism. Mm. By that, I mean understanding people's science within the epistemological framework in which they're, they're doing this work. And uh, this was, I think, an important part of what uh, Sabra, at least when I uh, knew him, uh, was very much trying to teach us that when we studied a figure like Ibn Lahaytham or Tusi or uh, Ibn Rushd or Ibn Sina, whoever, we had to understand that person within a broader intellectual context. What is their thinking? Not just look at, you know, their scientific product. Okay, Ibn Lahaytham wrote a book on optics, but why is he thinking of optics in this way? Why is he looking at optics from the point of view of an intromission theory as opposed to a mathematical extramission theory, for example? Why, why is he doing this? What, what, uh, what is the things that he's uh, thinking and what is the uh, epistemological framework? So uh, it was this something that uh, he learned from Popper to a certain extent. But again, I would say that Popper was more um, a philosopher of science. Sabra was more of a historian of science. He became a historian of science. He became more interested in the historical context uh, uh, over time. Um, and of course, you know, he left the 17th century re with regret. Um, he, um, he often would say to me that, um, you know, he sometimes regretted not continuing his studies of Descartes and Newton um, yeah. and, you know, uh, but he did find someone he felt was a kindred spirit, I think, in Ibn al Haytham. So, uh, I think so yeah. I, I'm not sure he thought of uh, people like Tusi and uh, uh, Georgiani as kindred spirits, but uh, he did think of Ibn al Haytham as a kindred spirit. Well, it, it's not a bad kindred spirit, too. You know, Ibn al Haytham uh, is, is no, very good. No, no <laughs> but, exactly. exactly. <laughs> My question, you know, yeah, go ahead. Sena will be asking a question about uh, you know the Sabra school and everything. But before that, uh, I want to ask your opinion about this because I have uh, the same idea that we need to understand. Uh, if, 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 for example, when I'm when I'm teaching science, history of science, and uh, about let's say the Babylonian science, the first lecture I give the history of Babylonia, explaining mm -hmm. what kind of things they have, and then explain the uh, the science they were doing because it is quite related that you have to understand why they are doing this. But at the same time, there are so many things in the Islamic world, the manuscripts and instruments I work on, as you know, scientific instruments. Uh, sometimes I start thinking, uh, should I focus on the instruments and explain them first and then go to the, uh, the general explanation and the, the contextualization? Uh, because uh, if you don't know uh, what's intended for in detail, uh, you can't actually put into the context as well. So there's always a question for me, which one should go first? And do you think there is a general idea that we should follow up or uh, you know, you know, subject basis uh, changes the, the, how we should approach the things? Um, this may surprise you, but you know, I, I tried, um, you know, uh, especially when I was first starting out, I tried not to read secondary literature. 
uh, I, tr I, I, in other words, uh, when I was working on a, a, like a text or something, I, I would read the text first because I didn't want to be influenced by uh, what someone else thought about it or you know uh, other people's ideas. Um, I it, part of this too is uh, a, again this problem that we talked about at the beginning was is this uh, idea that you know people are very influenced by you know received wisdom. In other words, what people have thought and written about and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the, there are narratives that you usually learn. Um, and it's, it's sometimes very hard to unlearn them. Mm -hmm. So if I were to recommend one approach over the other, I probably would say, you know, it would be good to uh, start from scratch. But of course, we can never do that completely. Yeah. It's it's Absolutely. it's an ideal, but uh, you know. That's true. Uh, and you know, we so sometimes you know I, I go to a text and I can't understand anything, so I have to go and Absolutely. read a secondary source. Um, so, in answer to your question, I think you know it, it's good to balance the two, but to always try to make sure that your ideas are coming from the text itself to try to avoid as much as possible having you know some uh secondary or tertiary source influence you too much about what you're reading um you know but again it's a it's a difficult problem because you know we're uh, we're always as scholars i mean we're supposed to engage with our fellow scholars and not just with the text. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. I was going to ask something about Sabre uh, as well. So uh, we see that he exerted a great influence, uh, not only in the histor historiography of Islamic science, but also in Islamic intellectual historiography with the theoretical studies he put forward. After the publication of uh, one of his articles in 1978, the appropriation and subsequent naturalization of Greek science in medieval Islam, a prelim preliminary statement, uh, his arguments were begin to be considered a unique approach and called Sabra thesis. In this article, uh, Sabra criticized the paradigm based uh, on defining the precursors of facts and ideas and creating heroes in the history of science explaining the introduction of Greek accumulation into the Islamic world, the, the concepts of appropriation and naturalization and subjected this period to a contextual interpretation. May I ask if we listen from you about the school of Sabra, his thesis and the students he trained? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's hard for me to talk about uh, that article objectively, uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I, I was sitting, uh, Bash and I went to a conference, it was one, of, one of the International Conference History of Science, it was at Berkeley, I think in 1985, and we were sitting next to each other and he handed me the paper, and it, it was basically uh, the appropriation paper, and uh, he said, it, and he made me read it somewhere between Boston and uh, San Francisco. And uh, so I was reading it and I handed it back to him and I say, oh, I, you know, I, I say, I, uh, you, I said, this is all old stuff. <laughs> and he was quite upset because of course it was all old stuff for me because I had heard it in his uh, classes, but it wasn't old stuff for, you know, uh, most most of the pe of the people who would be reading it, uh, he it was it, it was a fast. I mean, it was a very important article. It was very influential. Um, you know, I, I I guess I would say that the appropriation part for me was the most important part because it. Uh, 
made crystal clear something that had been said before but hadn't been hadn't registered and that is that uh islamic science was part of islamic societies was part of islamic civilization it, it, it seems like an obvious point but many many people had had written uh you know long learned pieces that Islam, uh, you know, anything that goes under the name of Islamic science was marginal to Islam. It had nothing to do with Islamic civilization. This was, of course, the, the uh, um, main point of Ernest Renan in his famous lecture at the Sorbonne in 1883. Um, basically, he said, if something happened within Islamic civilization, that looks scientific, then it's not part of the civilization. It has to be separate from it. So this forced him to say that the Abbasid, early Abbasid caliphs who had sponsored the translation movement, well, how could they be Muslims? They must not be Muslims. <laughs> this is the Abbasid caliphs now. I mean, Abbasid yeah. caliphs were not Muslims because they were interested in Greek science and philosophy. <laughs> that, that's the kind of, yeah. but, but it was like, well, if, if your starting premise is that any, anything in Islam that, you know. It cannot be related uh, to science, that, impossible. Yeah, that, 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 that tries to uh, promote Greek science and philosophy has to be anti-Islamic. Yeah. So if if a caliph does it, he must not be a Muslim. Absolutely. Yeah. The lo <laughs> logic demands that he, he is not a Muslim. So yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so Mahmoud wasn't a Muslim, I guess. Um, <laughs> but but you know, but even uh, you know Gustav von Grunebaum uh, in in an article that he wrote, and it was obviously later, but other people as well, Bernard Lewis, many other Orientalists, uh, also said the same thing. So. Sabra making this statement so crystal clear, I think was very important that, you know, yes, the Abbasids were Muslims. Yes, uh, Ibn Sina and Ibn al-Haytham were part of the Islamic civilization. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it, you know, the products of Islamic science were part of that world. And he turned the, um, the Ghazali question on its head. How did he turn it on its head? He said Ghazali actually promoted the what he called the naturalization of science into Islam by making it acceptable. How did he make it acceptable? Because Ghazali said, well, you know, things like Greek medicine is okay, Greek logic is okay. Uh, Greek astronomy is okay, as long as it promotes Islamic um, um, needs, such as, you know, prayer times or uh, doing inheritance law through not algebra or, um, you know, obviously medicine is important. So, this this was, I mean, a, a really interesting move by Sabra that, you know, that Vizeli, far from stopping science, actually promoted it. Yeah. But this is where I came to disagree with him, because he then went on to say, okay, but this science that Vizeli was promoting was like the handmaiden science of the uh, Christian world of the European Christian mm. world because it was instrumentalist. It was only good insofar as it was part of, or it helped the society. Yeah. But it was it was not what the early science had been, which is science for its own sake, science that was studied as a pure sort of thing. And uh, 
then, I mean, that was one of the conclusions he made was that this naturalization then was tied in with decline because this, this would not lead to things like the European scientific revolution. Okay. The European scientific revolution uh, was based on a different kind of premise than this kind of science that was post Vazeli. And here I, you know, I had to respectfully disagree because the people I was studying, you know, were talking about theoretical issues still. So anyway, that's, uh, I, I, I I don't know if that answers all the questions about that, but I mean, there's a lot more, obviously. There's a lot of more course, there. you can't actually finish everything up anyway. So we just uh, have some sort of a gist to it, perhaps. And thank you very much for that. That's, that's enough for it, I think. Yeah. And Sena is uh, having another question, I think. Okay, go ahead, Sena. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm having a little bit of time connection. Can you hear me well? Uh, can, I think... you, can you hear me well right now? I think we can hear you now, yes. yes. Okay, okay, I guess uh, I'm uh, having some trouble uh, hearing you, but that's okay. Uh, I'm uh, finally, I'd like to ask, uh, and I, I actually would like to draw the subject to the future of the historiography of history of science, uh, the Islamic Scientific Manuscript Initiative Project, which we can refer to as the Digital Humanities Initiative in the history of Islamic science. Uh, this is a, a project that has emerged as a result of the increasing interest in the use of technical digital methods and tools in social sciences and humanities. Could you tell us the story behind the Islamic Scientific Manuscript Initiative Project, which aims uh, to create an advanced database of all Islamic scientific works in the world, as in the project, the history of Islamic science can be enriched with the digital methods and tools such as big data analysis. In this context, uh, what should we expect from the future of the history of Islamic sciences what equipment do you think the future historians of science will need to have? Well, uh, let, let me just uh, quickly uh, tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, this actually began at the Suleymaniye Library uh, about, uh, oh, 25 years ago. Uh, my wife, Sally Raja, who is also my collaborator, uh, an independent scholar in her own right, uh, was going through the catalog at uh, the Suleymania and copying all the uh, uh, references, uh, the manuscript references to uh, astronomical works. And uh, of course, the, the stack of cards got quite large and so we thought, well, maybe we should try to uh, digitize this <laughs> or get a database. And, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> we had the model of one of my colleagues at Oklahoma, Steve Livesey, who was doing a catalog of uh, the works related to Peter Lombard's sentences. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, got a book called Access for Dummies, uh, which was, you know, my entree to databases, trying to make a, a database to do this. Uh, well, I wasn't that good at it. Uh, we, we started it, uh, but luckily we were able to get funding from the Canadian government when we went to uh, McGill, and we had a partnership with the Max Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin. And uh, they took over the technical aspects of the database, thank goodness. And uh, so we then expanded it, especially after the works had come out uh, from Ursica in uh, Istanbul and the Rosenfeld Isenolod catalog. We thought, well, uh, it, you know, we should really expand it to all the works on the exact sciences in Islam. And uh, so that's sort of how ISBI came about. Uh, unfortunately, after our retirement and uh, 
you know, we lost, uh, we're, we were in the process of losing our partnership with the Max Planck, uh, you know, we had to find another uh, uh, place to uh, uh, house the database. And fortunately, uh, my good friend and colleague and someone you know very well, uh, <laughs> Professor Esen uh, Fosliolo, uh, agreed to uh, house it at Madaniet. And uh, I, I think this is, a, this is just a wonderful development for a lot of reasons. One is, I, I think, you know, um, the interest in Islamic science in European and North American institutions is not continuous. Sometimes yeah. they're interested in it for, you know, for political reasons or other reasons. And then the interest wanes. Uh, you know, there are a lot of positions that have been lost. For example, Sabra's position at uh, Harvard was never uh, uh, continued. Yeah. Uh, David Pingree's at Brown wasn't continued. I don't think, I doubt that mine at McGill will continue. I mean, in other words, these positions are being lost. But what's happened, and it's like a miracle, is that in places like Turkey and Iran, uh, there's been first class work that has, uh, you know, uh, been going on for the past, say, 20, 25 years now. And that, wor uh, that work uh, and the support for it by institutions, uh, you know, in Turkey, Iran, and other places, uh, has, you know, meant that, uh, you know, there's a whole generation of new scholars that are being trained who have access to the material uh, and know the languages and have been doing really exceptional work. So uh, I, I feel that, uh, you know, there's, I'm very optimistic um, about the future because of people like like you and Sana and all of your colleagues and peers at uh, Madaniyet and other places in Turkey uh, and in Iran. Uh, hopefully, you know, things will settle in Syria and Aleppo hopefully, will yeah. uh, see a, uh, you know, uh, that will be resurrected. Um, so uh, the fact that ISMI is now at Madaniyet seems to me to be a wonderful and the best possible outcome uh, of you know uh, our work, and uh, we're just very glad to see that. Thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for your kind words. And I think science is returning to its own civilization. Then that's what we can say. It. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I I think that uh, the the engagement is is great too because look, you'll see things that uh, let's say. A German scholar might not see, and a German scholar may see things or think of things Absolutely. that you don't see. But the fact that we can engage and meet and discuss this, that's what's really important that we, you know, we're coming from different backgrounds. I mean, some really interesting work is being done in East Asia, in Japan, and China that's now true. on Islamic science. So, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, be, you know, a Mediterranean thing anymore. I mean, it's global and people are interested uh, in it uh, in, in our field. And I think it's developing in interesting ways because of that, so, yeah. Hopefully, yes. Uh, we're sharing the same good, good feelings with you. And thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for entire talk. And it was uh, absolutely wonderful for us to hear everything you said. And uh, I think uh, before finishing up, we have one question from uh, our uh, listeners. And it says, let me see. What do you think about speaking in terms of Islamic influence in Europe? Uh, does it detract from the importance of a post-classical history, post history of science in the Islamic world? How should we rethink or recharacterize questions of influence when looking at uh, pre-modern Europe and the Islamic world? 
that's the now, this is how do we look at Islamic influence on Europe or European influence on the Islamic world? I think Islamic or, influence in Europe. Uh, oh, how, how should we look on it? Um, I, well, I, 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 I think that, you know, there's, there's the textual part. I mean, some things are pretty obvious when you have a translation of an Arabic text into uh, uh, Latin or like I've discovered uh, that one, uh, a Persian work uh, of Tusi was actually redone into Greek and then finds its way uh, into um, um, let me see if I, sorry. Sorry. Um, okay, got, got you back. Uh, okay. <laughs> in, into, uh, actually ended up in Italy. So, you know, that, that's the obvious parts that we can say textual, but then there, there were also, um, must have been oral transmission or transmissions of different types that are much more difficult to pinpoint. So, but when we find, like my example before of Copernicus's Mercury model and Ibn Ashatar's Mercury model being identical, what does that mean? Well, we don't have a text. We don't have, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, we don't know that Copernicus knew Arabic or anything like that. But one of my colleagues, uh, Robert Morrison, or I, I'm sorry, it was Robert Morrison, but before him, uh, Svi Langerman, uh, found that uh, this fellow, Musa Galeanos, uh, who was for a time in uh, uh, the court in Istanbul, but he also traveled to Italy. He talks about Ibn Shatter's models right before the time that uh, Copernicus is writing. And he's talking about it in the area of the Veneto, of Venice, uh, right before Copernicus goes there to study. So does this prove anything? Well, I think it shows that there's more things we have to understand and look at. In other words, we need to, uh, think about oral transmission, we need to think about travelers, we need to think about the kind of uh, educational interactions that may be occurring. Uh, how do people in Europe know about what's going on in Samarkand? How do people in Europe know what's going on at the court of Mehmed II or Bayezid? I mean, how do we know uh, yeah. these things? And we have to start thinking about them. Unfortunately, I, I think that one of the real gaps is that the European scholars, the, Latin, the people who know Latin and can look in these texts and so forth, they haven't been as proactive, I think, in, um, I think they haven't been as proactive as they sh should be in to establish um, the, the the connections you mean yeah and 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 looking for these things i mean i once went with a uh uh of uh, uh you know a colleague to uh venice and we looked at greek manuscripts uh, uh at the uh, uh library there mm -hmm. and uh you know uh, th there was interesting, you know, uh, we didn't discover anything too exciting, but one thing was, you know, uh, a note that, you know, this is Ara in Greek, it said this is from Arabic learning. And, yeah. you know, uh, so they know things. I mean, you know, people like Bessarian, who went from uh, what's today Turkey to Italy, uh, carried with him uh, into Vienna. Uh, carried with him books and so forth. Uh, what did he carry? What was he doing? Uh, what kind of interactions was he having and so forth? So that's, that's part of the future, I think, 
that needs to be really looked into a lot more carefully. And, and there are many things, you know, I'm working with Oxford University at the moment, uh, specifically at this uh, topic and with the 17th century uh, Islamic uh, astronomy books in Oxford. Uh, with John mm -hmm. Greaves, for example, he, he, he actually he bought a lot of books and he actually studied them. Uh, he studied Ali Kushchu, he translated Ali Kushchu in, uh, in Latin and he worked a lot about uh, calendars and He's, uh, he is actually proposing a new calendar reform as opposed to the Gregorian calendar. And his uh, entire study based on Zij Ulube and uh, Ibn Shatr Zij. So literally wow. he's, he's working uh, uh, his own ideas through <laughs> the Islamic, Islamic Zijs. So that, that's something we, we have to work a lot, I think, uh, or the, the, the historians of science in the West, I think, should be focusing on a little bit more about the, just even the annotations on the manuscripts in their library, the Arabic and Persian manuscripts, uh, create a lot of uh, new information, new data that we can actually uh, share uh, with the East and West and the influence. So. No, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Arabic manuscripts with Latin annotations and Hebrew annotations and uh, Greek annotation. So, you know, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to, uh, to get from there. You're absolutely right. All right. Uh, one question more, and uh, I think this will be our last question, depending on the time. And could you please speak about what you see as the future or big questions of Islamic astronomy in the next 10 years, Copernicus and beyond? What does your vision look like or what do you hope to see? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, actually, I, I think uh, your work, Taha, is, is interesting because I think instruments are, uh, uh, are, are something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I think when we talk about instruments, things like institutions, in other words, concrete things, in other words, uh, if we look at something like an observatory, Sayulu said, well, you know, the Islamic observatories uh, influenced uh, Tycho Brahe. Well, exactly how? How do we, yeah. how do we see that? And the instruments that uh, Tycho had, uh, did he have pictures from those in Samarkand? How exactly does this, you know, work? How does it... Uh, manifest itself. And so work on things like uh, institutional uh, influence and also things like um, instruments really help this. Uh, you know, David King has done some work on, on this and others. Uh, also things like uh, hospitals. Uh, yeah. You know, th there was a dissertation years ago, I don't remember the uh, name, but it was by an Italian scholar talking about the uh, influence of Mamluk hospitals on Italian hospitals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these, uh, but these kind of things, you know, somehow they get buried in dissertations and so forth. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that needs to be looked at in a holistic way. In other words, talking about instruments and so forth. That would be one thing. I think another thing that I'd really like to see is more uh, studies of Ottoman astronomy and the way in which Ottoman astronomy uh, interacted with European astronomy, uh, you know, and ultimately, you know, culminating that wonderful uh, 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 picture that Kunawi uh, has in his book, 19th century book, showing uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune hmm. uh, with, you know, and calling it Le Verrier's uh, planet and Herschel's planet. But he knows this within like, 10 or 15 years, and he's heard that they think that they've seen satellites, moons around each of them and so forth. Uh, how are they interacting? Who, how are they, how are they learning these things? But there must be something beforehand too. I mean, you know, uh, scholars in Cairo and Istanbul, Damascus, they are hearing about what's going on in Europe 
and they're interacting. I mean, when we talk about modern science, well, part of modern science is also the fact of the uh, dissemination of knowledge globally and how this affects local knowledge and so forth. That's, those would be things that, you know, I would hope uh, would be looked at. And of course, well, and then there's the regular stuff that, you know, who knows what we're going to discover in the 90% of manuscripts no one's ever looked at. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. And uh, I think uh, this should be uh, done with the questions and everything as well. So. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jamie Rajat, uh, and thank you very much, everyone uh, who is listening to us. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. And, and thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and having this wonderful talk to us, Professor. Thank, thank, you, you, so thank you so totally. much. Thank you so much. This was totally you. inspirational. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sana. Thank you. All take right. care now. You take care as well. Have a good night for everyone and have an afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone who's outside. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye, Jimmy. Say hello to Sally also. Okay. Bye. <laughs>